<coughs> Tonight we'll be continuing in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 50th lesson. <coughs> As you probably know already, many professing Christians do not have an accurate understanding of what the Lord's doing in salvation. It, it hasn't come together for them. And this is largely owing to a, a sort of poverty of scriptural understanding. They don't have a working knowledge of the scriptures. They're not what I call Bible people. But it's not largely their fault. It's They've been cultured in a Christian environment that really didn't need very much of the Word of God. That's, that's the situation. And it's produced a, a spiritual poverty that's ast it's astounding. I mean, I'm, I've seen a lot of this, but I've seen so much of it, it it's staggering. The lack of understanding that exists in the Christian community. It's, it's startling. I, I don't think the apostles even knew the extent of this falling away. A lot of this is owing to what I call spiritual poverty of preaching and teaching. It's just been mediocre at the very best. That'd be the high view. Mediocre. Teaching. See, under the administration of spiritual Babylon, what has happened is the key of knowledge has been taken away. That's, that's what's happened. Amen. That's why people don't know, because they can't know. Yeah. Uh -huh. Key of knowledge has been taken away. Now, Jesus, this happened when Jesus was on earth, and it happened before that also. The, but here's what he said to the lawyers, and you read the word lawyers in the Bible, it doesn't mean lawyers like criminal lawyers. <laughs> So experts in the law of God. That's what the lawyers, and they were. The Jews, <laughs> the Jews are so far ahead of the Gentile church, it's a shame to even talk about it. In fact, there are some mega evangelists that are going to Jewish teachers to, to find out what the Bible says. It's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. That's what lawyers were. But these lawyers that were experts in the text of Scripture, here's what Jesus said to them, Woe unto you lawyers. This is public too. Yeah. Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. That's Luke 11:52. I charged the Pharisees with a similar type charge. He said, you have shut up the kingdom of heaven. <sighs> oh, brethren. That is so serious, there's no way to describe how serious that is. That's happened in our time. The kingdom of heaven has been shut up Amen. by men so people can't get in. Yeah. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, well, God can override those circumstances, but the catch is God doesn't. Yes, that's right. Somebody's got to rise up that knows the things of God and declares it. God's not going to drop it out of heaven. Yeah. Amen. That's what it's got to happen. Back under the law, the same sort of indictment was given to the priest. He said, the lips of the priest should preserve knowledge. Preserve. Yeah. Well, don't miss that. They should speak things so the truth would be preserved. Why, why have a lot of truths been lost? Why have some foundations been destroyed? Why is there some very rudimentary knowledge people don't have it anymore? Why is that? It's because the preachers and teachers did not preserve the knowledge. Amen. Amen. They preached in such a manner as pretty soon people under their preaching, because they listened to their preaching, they lost 
a knowledge of the foundations and stuff that was simple when I was 10. People don't understand today who are adults. I'm telling you the truth. It's a, it's a serious situation. <coughs> Paul said there were some people even in his day, even in his day, that subverted the hearers. That is, he caused them to swerve out of the way, overthrowing them and overthrow the faith of some. Can you overthrow someone's faith? Yes. You can overthrow someone's faith by distorted teaching. You sure can. It happened in Paul's day. These false teachers, what they had done is failed to give the people the kind of knowledge that would enable them to walk properly. Instead, they gave them their own opinions and creations and inventions and bodies of knowledge. And we know that it was a lot of baloney because it didn't work. Now what Paul is doing here, he's avoiding that kind of situation. He's doing something to ensure that doesn't happen. It already started to happen. As soon as he left, vultures swept in. He's doing the opposite of what the priest and the lawyers and the Pharisees did. He's doing the opposite. They took it away, he's bringing it back. The key of knowledge. All right, we're in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. This is what the spiritual teaching gifts, I will call them, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. This is a dialogue concerning what their purpose is, what they're intended to do. That we be henceforth no more children. I say, that would be from henceforth, that from now on, no more children. What it says, that's plain enough, isn't it? No more children. What about children? Tossed to and fro. Carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. That's what, that's what these gifts have been said in the church to get to assist people so they stop being children. We understand they start out being children. We understand that. But their salvation makes no accommodation for staying a child. So if a person insists on staying a child, he stepped outside the circumference of salvation because salvation doesn't make provision for that. God has it make provision to keep a person perpetually in a childish state. Amen. Yeah. That's not what Jesus died to do. That's not what Jesus is doing. It's not what the Holy Spirit is doing. So if it's being done, God has nothing to do with it unless he's blinded men's minds. That'd be the only other thing. Now notice in this passage from verse 12 on, <coughs> the logical presentation of this thing. The saints had prepared in order for the work of the ministry, in order that the body of Christ might be edified, in order that we all might come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, in order that we be no, henceforth no more children. See how it, you can't like skip over all that to no more children. No more growing up, in other words. No more children is at the at the end of a rather lengthy process. But it's not, and that's not the end. We're going to go, we're going to go further than that. <laughs> now the progress can't be realized independently. The ordained means you can't become mature by ignoring apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. See, you can't you can't arrive at a mature state by ignoring the means God has ordained to reach that state. So in my opinion, all faithless preachers ought to be out of a job overnight. There should be absolutely no tolerance of it. None at all. 
Jesus wasn't tolerant of it. God wasn't of old times. Now notice he said that we, <coughs> he didn't say that you, he said that we, 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 that word is used we, 562 times in the epistles. We. Not they, we. This is family talk. Yeah. Amen. This is talking about the household of faith. Jesus doesn't talk about the world except in a condemning way. Yeah. That's, right. That's how he talks about it. <coughs> and the word us is mentioned 277 times. That's another. It's a family term. We, us. Now we lived in Indiana. There was a mega church up there. In those days, it was 30,000 mm -hmm. attended. Yeah. This is how many attended. 30,000. Today it's 100,000. Attend. I said attend. Hammond Baptist, First Baptist Church. A hundred thousand people every Sunday attend and they don't get out till two. They bought up a whole section of town of apartment buildings, gutted every floor and made it an auditorium. They got these big screens in there. So they got every Sunday, they got upwards to 500 big buses that shuts Hammond, Indiana down. On Sunday morning. <laughs> but they would tell you that the main thing is not the church, it's the, it's the lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's their message. Right. Then how come God didn't raise up an apostle for the lost? How come he didn't write a letter to the lost? Uh -huh. See, the lost are reached by a living, vibrant Amen. church Amen. that's in fellowship with Christ. Amen. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Mm -hmm. Well, he's living in somebody. He's not going to stop that work. That's right. That's right. They'll not stop speaking with them. That's exactly right. Amen. The problem is, isn't that the church isn't doing anything. The problem is it is dead. That's right. Now, Paul's, Paul's teaching that God... He's not made provisions for a dead church. So, so if we've got a dead church, it's got to be raised from the dead. <laughs> or we're not going to get any place. Because in salvation, there isn't any provision made for a dead church. See, the saints, the epistles are written with the saints in mind. That includes letters to Timothy and Titus and Philemon. And Gaius and the elect lady. Those are epistles written to particular individuals. But they're written for the whole church. There's no letter writ letters written to politicians. Or entertainers. Or athletes. Or businessmen. Or aliens from God. There's no... There isn't any. Why? Because the ministries God placed in the church are for the church. Because yeah. the church is how God's going to carry out his program. Uh -huh. yeah. Whether it is reaching into areas the devil has dominated and rescuing souls, whether it's that or whatever, he's going to do it through the church. That's how he's going to do it. It's Christ's body. That's how he's going to do it. So the epistles... <laughs> expound the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement of Jesus. They open it up. The Gospels don't. The Gospels tell you that Jesus died. They do not tell you why. They told, tell you that he rose from the dead. They don't tell you why. The Gospels tell you they ascended into heaven, sat down the right, but they don't tell you what happened. There are still people who believe if you give someone the gospel of John, that's all they need. That's not true. They need it to be true. 
The Gospel of John is actually a, an apology to prove to Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But it, it does not expound the death of Christ. It does not expound the resurrection of Christ. It does not expound. It tells you that it exists, but it doesn't expound it. If you want to open up, you've got to go to the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and to the epistles. That's where you've got to go. To these things was his statement that gave his life as a ransom for many. Yeah, mm -hmm. what that meant, see? Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't have any idea what that meant. Uh -huh. yep. Unless you got some from the law, kind of a vague. Uh -huh. But that's what was expounded. Then they opened that up. Right. I see, uh, that's so clear now. Yeah. That's yeah. why the churches don't use the other part, you know, the parts. They'll, they'll preach out of Matthew and Mark. Yeah. You know, they'll preach about that. And I remember that. I didn't understand why, what, really what Christ yeah. had done. But I knew he was there. So mm -hmm. Satan allows that to be taught. And that has to be done. Yeah. We're not yeah. saying don't yeah. preach the Gospels. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying that after you've got to go on beyond that. See, one of, one of, he was actually one time one of my disciples, but he became a missionary and, and he translated the Bible, a section of the Bible. So he chose to translate Mark into their language. Now, it's not that that was wrong. It's just that I told him I'm not sure it's right. Because it ends up, you're you're up in the air. You, <laughs> it ends up go out and preach the gospel, but like you you're not quite sure what the gospel is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that to show that it's not generally no. This is not generally understood. There's a very low level of understanding about proper teaching and preaching. That we, it's a we in the household of faith, we that are in Christ, that we, and I like this word, henceforth. Now, it's a supplied word. That, that is not the translation of any particular word. It's a su supplied word because what's said here, there isn't a language that you can precisely state what's stated in the text. Some versions read, instead of henceforth, they say, as a result. It's a New American Standard Bible. The NIV says, then. The Revised Standard Version says, so that. The Holman Christian Bible says, then we will. All right, now, that, now well, let me take a little bit of time here with this word, henceforth. The idea is that there's a line of demarcation. Before it, old, after it, new. Before it, death. After it, life. Before it, alienated. After it, reconciled. <laughs> Before it, enemies. After it, accepted. Before it, ungodly. After it, denying ungodliness. We're less, it's a line of demarcation. Some people, I know, I've talked to enough people, though, some people can't define that line in their life. Now I'm not saying you ought to be able to d define it exactly. I wouldn't go this far. But there should be some kind of general idea that you have when your life changed. Because if your life didn't change, you're not in. And it's not our business to determine who's in, but it is our business to determine whether we are or not. So he's telling you, once you're in, that God's, ex God's going to expect something. Something is intended to take place after you come into Christ. Coming into Christ is the beginning, it's not the end. It's a start, it's not the culmination. From henceforth... See, blindness has got to be replaced with vision. And ignorance by knowledge. And dullness by sensitivity. And staleness by, with freshness. And deadness by life. And walking in darkness to walking in light. See, all that's, that's the henceforth. The latter part of those are the henceforths. From now on, we might, we might say. 
Now anyone with just a modicum of that is a bare minimum of knowledge knows that this is not the kind of environment that exists in Christendom. I mean, it just takes an honest person. You don't have to be critical. They, they know that there's just an in, inappropriate percentage of infants and babies and spiritual novices. They, they're, the two, they're too many of these kind of people. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. If we all had children, all our children, after they were 12 years old, they had, they, you had to still teach them how to talk and teach them how to walk. And you, you say, Some, something, something's wrong here. But see, that the church has not come to a strong enough something's wrong here. They're, they're, they're not living in the henceforth. They're still asking, what do I have to do? What, what do does the word of God forbid me to do? And they, they, this, this kind, and there's not that many that say that. As a matter of fact, that's true. Yeah, but sometimes the henceforth can can be visible to others. Oh the man, yeah. The man who took up his bed and walked. Yeah. I mean, he, he that was very. Everyone who saw him knew something happened there. Where Paul Saul went out to persecute the that's church right. and ended up building them up. That's right. <laughs> Light, though. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. You got that light's got to go off. There was a line. Yeah. See, that, yeah. that something right. had happened. The henceforth <laughs> presumes something happened. Right. There is no henceforth if nothing happened. Right. You know, I don't expect, though, to see the church do anything, really. I expect <laughs> no, the people to come out of the church, no. is what I expect. It can, yeah, the Satan says, no, it can't. See, if, the, if life isn't being made known, all arguments notwithstanding, mm -hmm. the prince of life is not there. Yeah, yeah, right. There's no other, I don't know how you could justify any other conclusion. Mm -hmm. The prince of life is not where death is dominant. Yes. Amen. I could remember, it, and it, it just been a few years ago, that dawned on me like a thunderbolt out of heaven. That's why... I've been, I was really upset because of the condition of things and lamenting about it. It's like the Lord's whispered in my heart, well, I'm not even there. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I'd share this with some of my brothers, you know. And so I did. I went down, I won't tell you where I went, but it's close by here. And they thought I was crazy. They thought I lost, flipped out. So I saw right away, well, I'm just going to be viewed as like a griper. So I just said, well, I didn't see it, you know, went back home. Didn't see it, but I could have done it. Was a, it was a major revelation. Yeah. I'd been concerned about something. I, well, I got, I, should I be concerned about this? How much have these people been subjected to that they rejected? How often has the Holy Spirit striven with them? Yeah. Uh -huh. How long has Christ called to them? There comes a time Jesus just said, that's it, your house is left desolate. Yeah. So when you got a desolate house, mm -hmm. most groups would say, well, that may be true of others, yeah. but not of us. Not huh? of us. We got to go now. <laughs> now, Paul will not under write in a way that undergirds that kind of an approach to Maine as just that things are kind of going downhill, people kind of losing fervor, but don't worry, if you're not as hungry as you used to be, we'll, we'll, we'll meet less often. If you don't want much, we'll just, we'll give less. Paul doesn't do that. He's preparing the church for God to take up residence. He knows that this is what God has revealed. The church is being built up for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God's going to someday move into this house, that is the, his household, which is the church. And Paul's getting it ready for that move. Because when God moves in, there's a fire goes out before him, the scripture says. And it devours anything that's contrary to him. That's, now that's just the truth of the matter. That's what happens. So he's preparing the church so they're not devoured. But advantage by the by the presence of God. Yeah, but given this is kind of like the same idea with this henceforth, is that when he moves in, there are certain things that you used to do you don't do it's anymore. Right. 
<laughs> but it's because of this. It sanctifies. That's it, right. it, it's where you, it, you you don't even want to. You have a new nature, and but that that it w would be impossible for you not to be able to detect. That's right. See, you're, he delivers you from the power of darkness. Yeah. That's what Colossians one thirteen. So the thing holding you back, you're loosed from the from its yeah. grasp. And then he translates you in the kingdom of God's dear son. All right, the kind of life that was lived back here can't be lived in the kingdom of his son. Amen. Just like over here, you die to God. If you don't live to up over here, you, 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 this will kill you. This environment will suffocate you. If you're not spiritual, you'll not be able to live in a spiritual environment. You'll not, it's not calculated to keep people like that alive. All right, so, so something's different when you get over here. This life is adapted for something else. Yeah. All right, now that you henceforth from now on, no more children. <laughs> Some versions say no longer children, which means it's like a long time we, <laughs> we spent there. No longer be infants, that's what the NIV says. Or no longer be little children. That's what the Holman's Christian Standard Bible says. Are no longer babes. Get in the picture here. That's what Darby says. Be no longer be like children. It's a living Bible. Stop acting like children. That's the contemporary English. No prolonged infancies among us. That's the message. Everybody, everybody pretty that dealt with the text pretty much knows what it's saying. The salvation of God has made no provision for prolonged childhood. So if a person is in that state and they think they're secure, that somehow God's going to keep them from falling, falling and the Lord Jesus will intercede for them, the Holy Spirit will intercede for them. You get all the benefits even though you're remaining in this condition that God forbids. Don't be children anymore what he said from henceforth the children they lack understanding that's their predominant trait and we all start there we understand but that's not intended to be a permanent state there comes a time when childishness must cease <coughs> you've got to be able to speak and think intelligently about the things of God there's still people who have a lot of trouble. They've been Christians for a long time. They just, just have a lot of trouble understanding things. Why? It's because they're children. And we need to encourage them, but you don't have to be children. God's made provision, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, see? You need to master the epistles, be able to quote them if necessary, memorize them if necessary, but get these epistles in your heart and in your mind. This exposition of who Christ is, what he did, what he's doing now, what he's going to do, what this is all about, what God intends, where God's going with this, all that's in the epistles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Messages to the churches. Yeah, some, some believe that the, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and pastor teachers actually are, are the containers of their wisdom. They, they understand yeah, they, <laughs> they understand it so like we don't. We don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. They, they got it all right there. They got it all together. We'll just listen to them. See, this is where people did misunderstand mm -hmm. the purpose for the gifts. Yeah. The reason why God gives this and that and the other to someone else is so they can pass it on. That's right. That's the purpose. To the rest of the members. Now there's a number, be no more children. There's a number of admonitions in Scripture that touch on this subject. For instance, be not children in understanding. Say, well, I can't help it. It's hard for me to understand, all right? That, that, recognizing the condition, that's phase, that's phase one. Now here's the Word of God to you. Stop being that. Now, if you believe what he said, I can tell you it'll drive you to God. You say, Lord, give me understanding. I, I don't want to be a child. 
You'll immerse yourself in Scripture. You'll find out what God said about this or what God said about that. You'll find out about it. Be no, in understanding, be men, he said. Be no more children. No more. That's the same as henceforth. No more children. Be, in understanding, be men. Amen. Be mature. Yes. Now, if you go to the, a local medical college, there'll be people there that can talk about medical procedures and things like this, but if you want an operation, that's not where you go. Right. You go to someone who is a man in understanding and can handle those things, yeah. see? Be men in understanding. And Paul says that when he became a man, when I became a man, I put away childish things. So what if a person hasn't put away childish things? He's not become a man. <laughs> the childish way of thinking, in other words. Paul wrote to the Philippians about abounding in knowledge. How about that? Philippians 1.9. In the letter of the Hebrews, he spoke of a time for the reason for the for the reason of the time you ought to be teachers. You've been in long enough now. You, I shouldn't have to be going over this about the principles. I shouldn't have to be going over this. You've been in long enough now. You ought to be teachers. And Peter admonishes his readers: grow now, grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So there's enough about this in the Scripture. In fact, Paul said he wrote to the Ephesians, I'm praying that God would enlighten the eyes of your understanding. See there? There's this growth taking place. He'll plead with the Ephesians, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. See? There it is. It's everywhere in the Scripture. <coughs> he wrote to the Colossians, he was praying that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See, this is the norm. In the kingdom. Amen. And John wrote that Jesus is come and has given us an understanding. So <laughs> there you are. Be no more children. Now there are terms that relate to spiritual adulthood that are in the scripture. I'll give you some of them. No. That's not like no. That's no like no how to swim. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that, kind of, that kind of no. No. Here's another one. Discern. That's an adult term. Discern. Here's another one. Comprehend. It's another. These are, these are adult terms. Here's one. Steadfast. It's an adult term. Unmovable. That's an adult term. Now there are spiritual processes that lead to this maturity. In root, in, include growing. Or going on to perfection. Or perfecting holiness, or pressing toward the mark, or adding to your faith. See, these are processes that move you forward in this. So henceforth, from now on, no more children. This is what God intends now. God, these ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they're to get you out of childhood and into manhood. That's what they're for. So if you've got to keep on telling the people what to do and giving them secrets on how to be successful at home and how to do the well in their job, and you keep on after telling them this. You mean like the counselors? Yeah. yeah. And this is what they preach about all the time. See, this, this is not adult type stuff. Right. You know, it's adults you're talking to, I know, but this is not adult type Things These are childish type things. It ought to be regularly apparent. If when a person is in Christ, if they encounter difficulty in any phase of life, no matter what it is, where it is, job, home, whatever, 
if you're in Christ, you'll have enough sense to know you go to God about this and seek God's wisdom about it. Amen. And when you, when you go down to Egypt for help, well, then there's something else. There should be no more children. Well, what's a trait of children? He gives a, he gives a trait. This is, you can't avoid this trait now. This is a trait of children. Tossed to and fro. It's a state of spiritual childhood instability. To throw her up and down or in and out or however you want to put it. It's like a ship that's at the mercy of the waves. Just however the waves go, that's how it goes. If people live like that, whatever the circumstance is, pulls them off over here. Here comes a happy circumstance. Whoa, they're rejoicing. Here comes a hard circumstance, and they're weeping. They're just tossed. Yeah. Tossed to and fro. Everything's a crisis that they can't handle. It's a crisis. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, if you're... It's not that it's wrong. It's wrong to live, to be, not get out of that kind of state. Tossed to and fro. James would call it driven with the waves. Just... See, there's teachings and circumstances that are like big waves. Yeah. And if you're not solid, anchored, they'll just pull you over here and pull you over there. Yeah. First thing you know, you'll be caught up in politics. Next thing you know, you'll be caught up in yeah. a yeah. public yeah. school system. Right. They, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Next thing, there'll be some faddish type teaching you get caught up in. Wavering with every, with here's how carried carried tossed and to and fro and carried about. <coughs> the other versions say blown here and there. The person who has grown up into Christ in all things knows what belongs to him, and he can employ these God honoring purposes in edifying the body of Christ. But the childish person can't do that. The childish person is waylaid by circumstance. Yeah. They may have had a lot of good things to say to the people of God, but when they're in a difficult circumstance, their mouth goes shut and they crisis and their heart begins to tremble. And yeah. It's because they're children. And there's a... You don't go beat up people like this. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the ministries... That God's put in the church are, des are designed to get people out yeah. uh -huh. of that condition where they're not carried about by every wind of doctrine. Mm -hmm. These are like straight winds. You know, there's these horizontal, Amen. these horizontal winds that can be very damaging, you know, almost do the damage of a tornado. But they're not like circular. They're like a what they call a straight wind. We've had them here, here in town. It's a gust. Wind of doctor. We might call them, this would be religious fads and crazes. <sighs> Here comes this new, <laughs> new fad, see? Yes, Brother Jeremy. Yeah, I was, I was uh, right before you said, you know, we don't have to beat up on people like this because no one has to stay in that situation. Yeah. When you're with Christ, he's not going to leave you in that type of situation. When you, Because, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ does, if you watch how he... He taught, remember when he calmed the waves, he rebuked them yeah. for, for getting up, upset. I mean, these were fishermen. They knew that this where's was a bad faith, situation. Yeah. yeah, where's your faith? Yeah. So, I mean, Christ won't leave someone like that. No. No. See, we have good news for this. He's, yeah. This is all resolved by adulthood, by growing up. This okay. resolves this situation. Uh -huh. So you, your purpose isn't to try and resolve situation A that caused all this trouble. If I could just, that's not the, that's not the way out. Yeah, that's right. The way out is grow up. Uh -huh. yeah. Which means you can grow under those circumstances. Grow up, right. amen. The only way to be unmovable <laughs> is to be anchored to something that doesn't move. Uh -huh. That's right. So that's what the gospel is about. It's a declaration of things that don't change. Mm -hmm. Exactly, amen. I mean, you know, we amen. change as we grow up, but Christ yeah. doesn't change. Amen. 
This shows you, brother, given that you've got somewhere along the line, you've got to be told this. Yeah, that's right. To grow up, yeah. it's not it. Yeah. Even though the spirit is willing to mature yeah. Yeah. and desires and yeah. has an affection for the things of God, the brother still need to be told mm -hmm. to move along now. Mm -hmm. See, it's because the old tempter. He's got ways of convincing people that they can't they can't do this. Oh, this isn't how they say it, but this is why they don't energetically pursue a solution to this, is be, is because they're they just figure this is the way it's supposed to be. And we are cast down. We don't deny this, but we're not destroyed. We're knocked down. We get up. Yeah. Yeah. We get up again. That's what adult. I can tell. You take one of these little children. You knock them down. They'll stay down there. They'll stay down on the floor. You take a mature person and knock them down, they get back up. Yeah. Oh yeah, they hurt, it hurt. You get back up, knock down, up, not knocked out. Yeah, right. Get back up again. That's the difference between adults and children. There's something very odd, <clears throat> something very wrong with someone who would be content to be in this state. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I remember when I was when I was a child, I came to a point where I got sick and tired of being a child. I wanted to be an adult. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to function like the grown-up people and do yeah. the things the grown-up yeah. people did and understand yeah. the things the grown-up people spoke about. Mm -hmm. I would imagine you'd ask any one of our children here. They'd say, "Yeah, I want to grow up. I mm -hmm. want to be big like you." You know, yeah. but it's a it's a very weird circumstance <coughs> in the churches where people have been babies for decades mm -hmm. and they're perfectly content with yes. it. There's something mm -hmm. very yes, wrong. Yes, it is. Yeah. Very yeah. seriously yeah. wrong. Some of them don't even know. Yeah. yeah. They don't even know that they're babies. Yeah, what, what this has taken from them and made inaccessible to them is mind-boggling. Yeah. All the things you need to survive, they're out of reach. Yeah. Right. The arms of a child are too short. So to get the resources, you've got to grow up. Yeah. Right? You, everybody sees that. Don't you get the resources, you have to grow up. Yeah, this condition. <coughs> in the beginning, this condition was caused because the, they, the, the, these preachers and teachers, and the, these, they, didn't, they didn't give them, the, 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 they didn't preach the gospel. They didn't yes, preach what, 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 what they needed to hear. That's right. They didn't expound it. They See, didn't expound it. It, a lot of people have heard that Jesus died for the sins of the world, and he did. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. Took away the sins of the world. But why he did. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very few people know that God couldn't save you if he didn't. If Jesus didn't do that, God couldn't save you. His love, so what? He, God needed this for, to save you. Yeah. But, Probably heard a lot about we need to do more. There's oh, yeah. not a lot being done, but you never heard much about we need to grow up. That's right. right. And, and you never heard much talk behind the pulpit about being children mm -hmm. and growing up. I don't remember hearing a lot of that. No, I don't remember hearing any of it. <laughs> the concept of growth is foreign. Yes, it right. is. Generally foreign yeah. in the churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when you first moved to this area, I can remember. Let, hearing, because I heard you at 78th. Yeah. I heard what you're, what, but something shifted. You you came here to a bunch of people who hadn't heard this kind of stuff. And I remember listening to your first 10 minutes of your message. You made the people aware of who they who were, they were yeah. in Christ. That's right. Every what message. was that? That's telling them why. Yeah. This Every was, message, yeah, yeah, I did. But see, this was, this was, this was, uh, this is exactly what the people need to hear. Oh yeah, they need to hear what, 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 who they are in Christ. Why? Because now the devil, he, he goes, well, wait a minute, that's not for you. Yeah, but it is. Here, see over here. Yeah. He's he has taken away my sins. Amen. But see, this is this is. I, have you ever? I've never heard in the, in my lifetime this approach. But see, this God gave you this. You yeah. you, you did it and. And look at the souls you've you've um, you've benefited, and not just you, but see anyone who preaches anybody, yeah. anybody who preaches what God's accomplished in Christ. This is be the result. See, I was a, <laughs> I was astounded when I came here because Joplin was supposed to be a sp sort of a spiritual mecca, but it was actually worse than Chicago was. It was and, and I realized that those places I, I held, in that, in that five-year period, I held 58 revivals. 
and I was never, no one ever complained at any of those revivals. I never had a negative response at any of those revivals. And every time I would announce, I spend this time and I said, who you are, mm -hmm. it changed the whole environment. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. I could have said you ought to be holy and you, you I could have said that, but that's not what, <laughs> that was my way of discovering whether these people were legitimate or not. I didn't know whether they were legitimate or not, but if they could rejoice in the truth, I do. Uh, that's as that's yeah, legitimate. Yeah. Legitimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in a lot of the circles that I, that I grew up in, uh, whether at home or here in Western, I did hear a lot about, okay, you know, as someone new in faith, they need to grow. Yeah. But the, the problem with that wasn't what I saw. It wasn't that they weren't told or, or expected to grow. They, they weren't instructed on how to grow. Yeah. They, yeah those what that were meant. saying yeah. it didn't know themselves. Yeah. They were just telling yeah, I know what, you what mean. they heard where they weren't. They, yeah, I know they what didn't you have mean. an understanding themselves to be. Yeah. Able, didn't you know. know what that was. Yeah. 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 Maybe that meant you should win more souls. Or... or or just read more. Read more. Read That's more. right. Yeah, sometimes that, you know, if you, if you know more of the Bible, then that was probably their <laughs> thought of what growth Yeah, up. That's right. And you see how he's spelling it out here in this text. He's spelling out what growth is. No more children, dust. Yeah. He's spelling it out yeah. for you. And then each person, they have to examine themselves. We can't, we can't examine the other person's heart. We, right. <laughs> we're not equipped to do that, and I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. I don't want that responsibility. Can you imagine how you'd feel if you could read what is in everybody's heart? Fine. That'd be a... <laughs> Only the Lord could stand up under that kind of knowledge. So he's going into this quite uh, extensively. Be no more children tossed to and fro over a wind of doctrine. Then he tells you that there are, there are enemies out there, plants by Satan... And their purpose is to get you all confused and get you sidetracked as, because they're operating under Satan by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Well, that, <laughs> Now this is the serpent behind this. He's the deceiver, but see, he's got a whole battery of people okay. and spirits that are working for him. These are Satan's servants. Yeah. They're referred to as his ministers. Paul said in Colossians 11:14, they transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. So they have this appearance of being ministers of righteousness, helping you to be better, helping you to do what's right, and all this sort of thing. But they, that's not what they do. But the only way you'll be able to detect these, detect these people is to grow up. Do you, None of us are able to precisely define who these people are. If you've ever tried, you know what I mean. You can't just nail down who it is. It's the effects that they that happen that tell you who they are. It's the effects. If they build up the saints, that tells you who they are. And if they confuse and tear down the saints, that tells you also who they are. The men of this text are not people found in the entertainment world. Right? That's not the kind of people we're talking about. Or they're not the world's educators. These are religious people that present themselves as representatives of Christ. But they're actually Satan's representatives disguised as ministers of righteousness. Now I use this phrase by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. Some versions say trickery. <coughs> Cunning, twisting, clever, wiliness, cleverly lied. You've ever done uh, business on the internet, you'll find out about tricks and cleverness. Someone will say, this is only $14.99. They don't tell you a month. Hmm? So you sign up, and I, I had this experience. I checked my bank account. I said, "What are these fourteen ninety nine? I mean, there's a whole string. of what, what are these?" So that's what I found out. 
He said, well, it was on the screen. I looked. You had to have a magnifier. Look in there. Trickery. All right, there's some, there's some doctrines that people have to trick you to believe them. They catch you unawares and throw it into your mind. <laughs> Cunning gifts. Now their motivation isn't to deceive you. Their motivation is to exploit you. But they've got to deceive you to exploit you. They're like Balaam. They prophesy for wages. Wages of unrighteousness, they're called in 2 Peter 2.15. Now the cleverness of these people is after the flesh. It's not spiritual cleverness. It's more than just being creative or inventive. It's, it's more than that. Some people can make a lie sound good. Yeah. Yeah. Now the Lord will tell you, in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. But some people, they teach that no, that doesn't really mean that. It, Faith is in you, you've got to just release it. But everybody has faith. Well, yeah, they teach this. And they have a crafty way of teaching it so that if you're ch a child in your understanding, you've, you're taken in by it. If you're a man in understanding, you see right away, oh, <laughs> this isn't right. So growing up is a protection. It's not just a duty. It is a duty, but it's not just a duty, it's, it's a protection. Yes, yeah. There are some enemies that they don't bother adults. Mm -hmm. That's right. And there's predators that prey on little children. Mm -hmm. They don't prey on weightlifters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now like Israel of old, they provoke God to anger with their inventions. Psalm 106, 29. See, their methods, they're, they're their inventions. Their programs, they're, they are their inventions. Thus they defile with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. So they got... Their product is what led them astray and is what leads people to listen to them astray. It's their product. So as true as Solomon said... Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they've sought out many inventions. So there are in the religious world <laughs> many inventions. I would probably say that probably hardly a week passes there's not some new corrupt invention. Now the doctrines of these men have been formed because of their pride. And this fulfills the Psalm 100 and 1969. They have forged a lie. See? Just like a person can forge and shape a piece of metal, there are doctrines that are forged on the anvil of flesh. They're forged and shaped craftily so that they sound good and offer a lot. This is what makes their doctrine so reprehensible. They've constructed them like a building. I mean, it's a deliberate. See, it's not, it's not something that people accidentally said. They forged this thing. So they may call it seed faith or some, something else like this, but they built this thing. This is something they forged with cleverly, wittingly. They forged it. They Yes. Yeah, that appeals to the flesh, yes, to not does. the spirit. Yes, it does. Like you take Mary Baker Eddy, the mother of Christian science. She forged a dogma. Then she sold. That's right. She sold people on the legitimacy of it. Yeah, hmm? yeah and just like uh, every good doctrine is forged by Jesus ultimately, That's right. Satan has forged all these. That's right. Yeah. So they're not, they're not just a will-o'-the-wisp or something accidental. Or de Satan's got a tactic. Yes. He's employed to snare people. He can't snare the, the one who's mature. Yeah. So he targets. Amen. And in our day, there's so, there's so many of these. It's like a wide open field for, for the devil because there's so many childishness. Now some of these uh, 
doctrines. Right, let's name let's name some of them. That now these are things I'm going to mention. But there's whole a whole body of teaching that surrounds each one of these things. God loves men unconditionally, and there's a whole host of things built around that. God cannot hate. We come across that in recent years in the internet. God's going to save everyone. We come across that yeah. fairly recently. Once a person's saved, they're guaranteed of heaven. Then there's a whole body of teaching that goes with that. There's an experience that supersedes salvation, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is taught by a lot of people now. This is now this is what this is where the power is, right here. Right here. This is where you get the real power. Or that healing's in the atonement. Jesus died so you could be well. But see, it's not true because being sick doesn't alienate you from God. You don't have to be reconciled to God because you were sick. You can see that, I'm sure. <laughs> or believers can call things into being. They can call things that are not as though they were. It's taught to make it, make it preachers on the TV. Teach this all the time. Seed faith is the law of the kingdom. You can't get anything unless you sow. Even though the Bible says they reaped where you sowed not. Or the Bible said you sowed and didn't reap. <laughs> Even though that's in the Bible. Yeah. These people, that's not what they say. Well, they can guarantee that uh, a routine that will enable you to recover from your sin. Easy steps. Very easy steps. Or they talk about the carnal Christian. Just like a spiritual devil. Well, the lives of those in Christ being out of control. It takes people to confess this to the, to the assembly they're meeting with. Celebrate recovery. This is part of the routine. You stand up and you say, my, I love Jesus with all of my heart, but my life is out of control. This is what Christians are taught to admit. Well, they'll say... <coughs> Like everyone else, Christians are sinners. The difference is they're just forgiven. Now these have all been crafted very subtly, but they're all for children. Yeah. Nobody who's mature in Christ they can right, they would see through this right away. That this is not how God says it at all. Now my, one might wonder, well, how can doctors like this gain such popularity? There's at least two reasons. One is they're very cleverly constructed. And the other is they're designed for the uninformed. So here's your protection. Your protection isn't study about Mormonism and get all the details about what it's about. It isn't study Muslimism and find out what it's all about. It's grow up and then you'll see. You'll see right through it. That's the secret, see? Because when you grow up, you're getting closer yes. to the head uh -huh. who communicates the easier with you, mm -hmm. see? And you are more directable by him. And you're in a position where you're in the light so you can see more. Mm -hmm. So this is a secret to overcoming this. Yes, it's spiritual growth. Amen. Not, not become an expert in the heresies. Jesus said that my sheep will hear my voice yeah. and they won't follow another. The way, right. the way that a sheep becomes, becomes accustomed to the shepherd's voice is being near him. Amen. Amen. Remember when Solomon, when the Song of Solomon, the woman's lover came to her house. She was in bed and asleep. He knocked on the door and he finally roused her. He put his hand to her. There's a hole in the door where a latch or something was there, put his hand in. He said, it's me, you know. She said, well, just a minute, I gotta fix myself up first, perfume myself up. So she fixed herself all up, perfumed herself all up, and when she went to the door, he's gone. Took her too long to get ready. So she went out looking for him. And she found some men, she said, where, where, where's my, where's the shepherd at? He says, look for the sheep. Yeah, if you're familiar with Song of Solomon, you'll remember the text. Just look for the sheep, wherever the sheep are. 
That's what a shepherd will be. <laughs> it's still the way it is. See, when you grow up, you kind of stick more with the shepherd. Makes more sense. <coughs> now they lie in wait to deceive. They're plotting. They're thinking of careers, money, institutions. But the scripture just cuts through all that and says they're lying in wait to deceive. <coughs> and those, um, they're like the whorish woman of the Proverbs. Solomon is telling his son about this horse woman, Proverbs 9, 14. She sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high place of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanted understanding, and you told him, come in here. You, who you don't know much, turn in here. This is, this is the Horace woman. It was a prostitute that he's talking yeah. about. He's trying to lure someone in there. Now she says the same thing that wisdom cries. Proverbs, the ninth chapter. This is about, a few verses earlier, this is about wisdom says the same thing. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars, she crieth on the highest places of the city, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. Here's what she said, the horse woman invites into her dwelling, but the, the wisdom woman says of the horse woman's home, the dead are there, and her guests are in the depths of hell. That's Proverbs 9.18. <laughs> That's what the woman is understanding. But they're both saying the same thing. They're both calling out to the simple, saying, turn in here, come on in here. So here's divine wisdom, who is, which is personified in Christ, and he's calling out to the, those of childish understanding, say, turn in here now. Come in here now, and I'll show you these things. The same token. Yeah. Here's the devil's ministers over here, and they're saying the same thing. Who is so simple? You don't know much. Come in here. Yeah. Come in here. Now you got to grow up to tell which voice is which. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yes. You can't tell just by the words. The yeah. words are the same. Yeah. Yeah. But he tells you the wisdom tells you now nah, that woman on the street that is calling to you. If you go into your house, it's cluttered with dead folk. Yeah. It's cluttered with dead folk. Uh -huh. And uh, the guests that are staying there, the depths of hell. Yes. Amen. But we learn from this text that the work of the Lord is never intended to be carried out in an environment of perpetual simplicity. Right. Yes, we do have to start there. And we To bring people out of simplicity, you have to kind of address them at this lower entry level. But as they grow up, you don't come in that door anymore. It's like it's like a tower. Truth is like a tower. It has various entry entry levels, just like an apartment building, you know, and each floor has an entry level. Well, in growing up in Christ, each entry level has a access door. Amen. That at that he can enter at that level. Instead of every time truth enters, it doesn't enter at the low level and climb up to the <laughs> It, enter, it can enter into the high level. If you got a high, if your spiritual stature is like a high tower, mm -hmm. you get truth at a higher level up here. Mm -hmm. that's right. And that's the advantage of growing up into, Amen. into Christ. <laughs> now, a failure to mature guarantees a fall. <coughs> that's the point of Hebrews 6. Right. Failure to mature guarantees a fall. Now, how long do you have? I think it's probably a lot shorter than people think, but you don't want to speculate how long have I got. Yeah. Today right. is the day of salvation. Amen. This is the acceptable year. So yeah. you start where you're at. Yes. Amen. And you you ask God to give you grace to grow. You What, what do you know? Mm -hmm. And live up to what you know. Yes. Then you'll get some more. Then, yes. then you live up to that. Mm -hmm. Get some more, and to, and, get, and to guarantee you get some more, mm -hmm. 
apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. They're stationed all along the way mm -hmm. Amen. to assist this growth process. Amen. I think I'll close there. Any of you have something you'd like to add to that? <laughs> it seems as though Paul is saying that he's teaching in such a way that that when, when someone hears him, if they're serious, they'll determine. That's right. Now, they're not going to grow out of it overnight, but they'll determine right now, from now on, I'm not going to be a child. That's right. And but, but until that determination is, is, is made, that you really don't have any guarantee you're ever gonna ever gonna grow at all. No, and let's, let's be clear about this: you will never reach a point where you will no longer say, as long as you're in the world, where you will no longer say, "I have not yet apprehended that for which I've apprehended." You'll in this world, you'll never get to the point where you don't say that. I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended, or some say, I've not taken hold of that for which Jesus took hold of me. So Jesus took hold of us so we might obtain something. Amen. Not just so be something, might obtain something. Amen. And the longer you're in Christ, the more you realize that's a lot he's given you to obtain. Yes. And as, as you look out over the horizon of truth, you, you, you can't see the end. It doesn't make any difference how long you've lived. It's still, oh, it's way out there still. And so you, so growing is something you never stop doing. Amen. <coughs> I'm not sure you'll even do it in eternity. I'm not sure you'll stop growing. But it's quite a truth to see. Anyone have anything? Yes, Brother Paul? <coughs> I mean, there's a, speaking of growing up to maturity here, it's actually what love actually is. Love is something that brings you up into maturity. But what Babylon or the world sees love as is something that babies you, which is why people stay in that perpetual state. They, they feel the need to be babied, and that's what they define as love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, children need love as well as adults. We oh, quick to, we quick to acknowledge that. Yeah. You have to cradle children, you have to nurse them, and so forth. But the, God hasn't appointed eternal nurses. <laughs> yeah. uh <-huh. laughs> then pretty soon as you grow up, then you'll be, you'll be able to nurse That's some. Right. You'll be able to nurse some Amen. of the children. Yeah. See? And pretty soon if you're a child, you've got, you got a whole lot of people nursing you. Just don't have, just don't have a, one person up. Mm -hmm. I forget what they call it. Mammy, you know, you don't have this one person. You got to, in the body of Christ, you got a whole lot of people That's right. Amen. nourishing you. Knew that themselves require nourishment. So we're all growing. Amen. <laughs> yes, Brother Jonathan. I've noticed the uh, part of the immaturity in the church is there's a discontentment to learn. Like they're at a level and they're like, well, don't go beyond this level, don't talk above that level yeah. otherwise they won't get it but if if you think about it if that method was applied to like any other place like our education system wouldn't last eventually <laughs> the kindergartner has become a first grader yeah. eventually you know it steps up so people even at a young age in a secular world constantly being taught new things being taught new methods yeah. that are more advanced than where they're currently at and that's how they you know become like they get careers and things like this but yeah don't go beyond this that it wouldn't work in the secular world no. today you have to learn you've got to be taught over your head mm -hmm. That's right. learning is is a grasping the things over your head so if you never hear anything over your head you won't grow Kind of elementary, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but some people they can't they they, they resist it. So, well, I don't. That's way over my head. Yeah. One one brother in Indiana. He was uh, he didn't know when he first came. He didn't know how to read. His Danny Powers' father didn't know how to read. So he learned to read in the assembly out of the King James Bible. So he came to me one day. He said, "Brother Given, I, I don't understand what a thing you're saying." all over my head. So, Brother Andy, you're trying to understand everything. Here's what you want to do. Try and understand one thing. It may take you the whole service as day when I used to preach a couple hours. <laughs> Just learn one thing. And pretty soon you'll 
who've been learning two things, that he told me some not long ago, he said, this is working, he says. I, I, I get this. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to take, yeah. put little bitty short arms around a great big, <laughs> and he couldn't do it. So that's what, if, if you're in a state mm -hmm. and a lot goes over your head, don't have a mental shutdown. Mm -hmm. Try and get something. If you're a child, just try and understand one thing. And then once you do, if you still some time left, try and pick up something else. That's the secret to learning. But I see it's got to be over your head. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful that salvation is designed the way it is. And this whole matter of growing up into Christ is a marvelous mystery from one point of view. But it is very gratifying to know that your salvation makes provision for us to make some advancement in your eyes. And we pray, Lord, you give us grace, everyone, to do this and to everyone to contribute something to the growth process of others and everyone to receive from others things that make for growth. We thank you for this whole arrangement in Jesus' name. Amen.